Welcome to uh, this education event. Uh, we are covering e-cigarettes and youth vaping today um, and are so appreciative of you all jumping on. And if you want to introduce yourselves in the chat, please feel free. Um, you know what what your role is in the community or in your family if, if you're a parent um, if you participate in prevention kind of anything you want to say about yourself uh where you're from what you like um i help on the education side of the parents against vaping e-cigarettes team um and we run all sorts of education events uh nationally um, and are just so, so grateful that we have Courtney and Bruce here with us today and want to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves real quick. Courtney, I'll let you go first. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. You waste the time. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Courtney Calvin. I am a public health educator with our local health department. I'm super excited to have you here. You could be anywhere you want to be right now including the beach with warm weather. Uh, but you're here listening to present on e-cigarettes and youth vaping. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We are super excited for this presentation today. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a real privilege that we're able to be uh, your facilitators as volunteers today. My name is Bruce Barcelo. I'm the Senior Program Coordinator for uh, our Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health uh, Program. I'm also, I, I have multiple hats. Uh, I am the director of implementation for Solder Technology, who is, they are the originator of the fly detector that a lot of schools are purchasing and placing in their restrooms, locker rooms, and that, and that type of thing. Then just recently, um, I've been invited to join the faculty of the Breathing Association in Columbus. And so in being part of that faculty uh, is they train certified tobacco treatment specialists, doctors, nurses, uh, individuals that want to help people um, through their quit process. So it, it, it's a real privilege to be part of their faculty as well. So that is a little bit about who we are as professionals. And so we will be your facilitators today. So let's jump right into um, the, the program and the webinar. Next slide. We're going to cover a lot of different things. We're going to talk about who PAVE is, talking about the national epidemic of vaping, the uh, predatory, uh, the, the big tobacco, and the pernicious. That means how they have disproportionately targeted black and brown communities with their advertising, why teens vape, the, the health harms and what parents can do and, or, or, and caregivers can do. Next slide. So it's fascinating, and we're not going to be able to go into great details about the origins of PAVE, but it's fascinating. Um, a representative of Jewel came to the founders, and, and that this is Meriden Berkman that you're seeing on the screen as they were giving testimony before Congress, but they came to their, their kids' school saying that Jewel was absolutely safe. And so what they like to say is they mess with the wrong moms. But PAVE is a national advocacy and educational nonprofit powered by parent volunteers. So we're volunteers. Courtney and I are volunteers. There's a huge network of volunteers. When we're through today, we're going to talk about your opportunities to be volunteers as well. Next slide. So PAVE is active on a national level, on a state level, uh, level, passing laws and policies, as you can see in the pictures with congressmen, again, at a national and state level, 
as we are, and you can see um, that Meriden was involved in a White House, I don't know that they call it a summit, but basically it was that when President Trump convened um, leaders from around the country to discuss the vaping epidemic. So it, it's, PAVE has been on the forefront of addressing this issue on a national level. So where are we today with this vaping epidemic that we're seeing impact our youth on, uh, on such a huge scale? Well, that's real hard to say because when they attempted to get numbers um, as to the number of youth that were vaping in 2021, the numbers were really skewed. It, it looked like the numbers had dipped dramatically because the numbers of youth vaping had continued to climb uh, year after year. But then in 21, it looked like they dipped. So basically what the FDA said was, we're throwing the numbers out from 2021 because it, it wasn't meshing to what we saw. But so maybe it was because they attempted to take the survey while the kids were at home with COVID for whatever reason they're throwing it out. But, but here's what I can tell you. Here's what we've heard from all around the country. When kids returned to the classroom last fall, instantly, my phone as, as director of implementation for solder technology, I talked to school administrators from all around the country. Instantly, the, my phone began to ring. And I, again, I, and I present in national conferences all around the country. And the phone began to ring because um, the youth, that, that vaping was back with vengeance. So it seems, we'll find out when, when the youth survey numbers come back, but everything is telling us that the youth vaping trends have certainly increased in the last year. So, so as we talk about um, youth vaping and trends, um, disposables are rising in popularity. Um, with Puff Bar being the most popular among teens, and this is a brand, up to 10 million disposables are sold per month at convenience stores across the United States. Vape detector sales are increasing drastically for schools. And uh, most recently, 650 school districts, as well as many state attorneys, sued Jewel and won, as of this week, um, $440 million settlement to 33 states, including Puerto Rico. And while we realize this um, is great news for those um, who did sue, sue Jewel, we realize that there is still a lot of work to be done um, in terms of getting these um, bans in place and targeting for our children. Next slide, please. So Ohio Youth Vaping here, as Bruce discussed, um, data is from 2019, and 22% of high school students have ever tried a cigarette, 5% are currently smoking, 48%, almost half, uh, reported that they've ever vaped, and 33, 30%, excuse me, have reported that they are currently vaping. So as you can see, this rise here, um, there is still work to do, and um, each of us on this call has a role to do so. Next slide. Um, a generation of teens who would otherwise have not used nicotine. So as you can see here in 1991, 27.5% of high schoolers admitted to smoking. 2019, such a drastic drop with 5.8%. E-cigarettes in 2013, 4.5%, and in 2019, 27.5. percent 
So we are currently back where we were when cigarettes were a thing, but now it's been replaced with vape. Next slide. Youth marketing. So as we can see, here are some uh, marketing ads youth are seen on a daily basis, whether it be on social media, whether it be in magazines, ads, as such. And so we realize that youth who have social media usage have a positive perception of e-cigarettes and what they are. And those students also have a high projection of e-cigarette use when they are um, exposed to ads such as these. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Email and social media. So here's just a blurb real quick that I'll read um, that has been found um, pushed towards teens and youth. It says, we know that the inside vibes have been quite a challenge. And this is talking about when we were in the thick of COVID. Um, it says, stay sane with Puff Bar this solo break. We know you'll love it. It's the perfect escape from the back-to-back -back Zoom calls, parental texts, and work from home stress. So this again has been pushed to our kids. Hey, want to ease stress? Go ahead and vape, puff far is the way. And so when we look at websites, they're telling our kids it's the perfect way to start their day, escape reality and the normal. And so what teenager, what young adult, what young person wouldn't believe that vape has a part in making that great escape, if you will, uh, from just everyday life. Next slide marketing then and now this is just to show that nothing much has changed they swapped out some people um we still have our attractive men if you will in the ads um they swapped out the marlboro cigarettes and now we moved on to blue electronic cigarettes so nothing has really changed with these ads it's just they've upgraded them um, in terms of marketing towards our young people next slide please point of sale marketing so we know that our youth are targeted at the point of sale, the moment that they walk into a store. Ads and advertisement and products on the windows, the cash registers, eye-level displays at gas stations, convenience stores, and smoke shops. We know that there are a higher density of tobacco retailers near schools. So why wouldn't they go near where places that teens and youth are? So they're really, really good about that, going into um, those places where they can spot kids. Um, more addicts for children equals more tobacco use. They are advertising more near low-income neighborhoods and those um, where people of color typically live. We've even more recently noticed um, vape products stashed in where candy is. So if you look at some of these ads, you can see vape products stuck right in between where uh, youth will go to get candy. And this is something that we know is not okay um, for our youth to see and be exposed to. So definitely within eye reach, definitely um, on eye level. And uh, just wanted to kind of show some of the pictures there where you can see the vapes are stuffed in between candy. Next slide. Um, predatory tobacco industry targeting. Tobacco companies are very smart. They're very strategic. They are targeting our LGBTQ population our military veterans, our low-income neighborhoods, rural populations, racial and ethnic minorities, Native Americans, and people with mental illness. So most of us know, love, or around someone from these populations that are listed here. And if you notice, those populations are often more, more than once smoking, using some type of tobacco product. It's all by design by these um, smart tobacco companies. Next slide. Menthol. Historic industry is targeting African Americans. Um, most African American smokers who do smoke use some form of a menthol, um, whether it be Newports or Cools, and that's 85% of African Americans. If you have not seen the video Black Lives White Lungs, it is a mini documentary. It is phenomenal, and I would encourage everyone on this call. Um, to take a look at this video it is mind blowing. I've seen it like 10 times. And every time I learn something different um, about just how tobacco companies have specifically targeted African Americans. Um, there's also an African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. And we'll put these in the chat to the links as well. Saving Black Lungs. 
uh, menthol also encourages nicotine addiction and dependence. So we realize again, tobacco use is an addiction. It's very hard to kick the habit, especially when um, nicotine and menthol are involved. Next slide. Yeah, thank you, Courtney. Uh, Dr. Phil Gardner, one of the four Hello. most scholars on menthol, Hi, how are you? makes, uh, if you can put your phone on, on, on mute, that would be great, makes the profound statement, menthol makes the poison go down smooth. And I think that's tremendously important to understand. So why are these products still available? And the reality is that the FDA has simply failed throughout the years. In 2009, the FDA had an opportunity to uh, really take control over e-cigarettes and they failed to do so. When they did have an, uh, really the opportunity in uh, 20 to have an impact, they just uh, had an impact on pod-based systems leaving disposables, um, e-liquids, and menthol products. Uh, they left those alone. When they did start having, um, taking and, and deeming authority over e-cigarette products, there was a, a, a loophole for synthetic. They just gave a Congress a, a authority to take um, authority over synthetics. So as of August 15th, just literally a, a few weeks ago, um, the FDA hasn't granted authority for any sale of any synthetic nicotine product, but yet we see them everywhere. Next slide. So disposables, like Courtney had said, has absolutely exploded a thousand percent rise of the use of disposables um, on the U.S. market. What's also real dangerous, uh, I'll say, for disposables is the reality over, over a pod, the nicotine level can be up to uh, anywhere from five to 20 times higher than a pod base. So the nicotine levels can be a lot higher than we saw even with a jewel in disposable products. So they're much more popular and nicotine levels can be much higher. Next slide. Again, when the FDA did take some authority over e-cigarettes, they didn't, um, th there were other products they did flavor, pod-based, pod but they left the system still on the market. So many of these products are still on the market. Next slide. The FDA did nothing about the tens and thousands of flavors. We know that youth are attracted to the flavors that are on the market. And practically anything you can think of is available on the market. I remember I was invited to participate in a world e-cigarette summit. And someone was talking about the flavor unicorn puke. And I said, why in God's green earth is unicorn puke? allowed to be sold on the market. And it was like I spoke heresy. Well, adults need unicorn puke, blah, 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 blah. No, they don't. Youth are attracted to, to flavors like that. So look at some of these different flavors and tell me that's not for the youth market. Next slide. So not only are there products out there that are, are made specifically to attract the youth market, but we are seeing a tremendous increase 
for other flavored nicotine products for a lot of different reasons. With schools trying, doing the best that they can to slow the nicotine, the e-cigarette e rise of youth use in schools, especially like with, with um, athletes and on and on and on. These products are on the rise so that so youth are turning to these as an alternative during school hours. And look at what some of these products are saying to get the youth market. Things like when you look at the Lucy Nick, our lozenges are discreet and mess-free, which means you can bring them with you wherever your wanderings take you. The mints look like they're small, like Tic Tacs. Look at the young lady with the sunglasses. It, it's a small little vial with small mints. The, the Lucy gum looks like a package of gum that you could easily put in another wrapper. Um, the, the Zen pouches, it's spitless, so you don't have to spit. It's, it's a small little pouch that you put between your cheek and your gum and, and, and you, you swallow the saliva, no one would ever know that you have that pouch in. The Pixotin is a toothpick. I mean, who's gonna stop you at school if you have a toothpick in your mouth? Probably no one. And so these products in, in your um, convenience stores, if you pay attention in your convenience stores, these products are all over the place. So extremely popular. Next slide. And then, then we hit the non-nicotine vapes that are so perfusive in the teen market. I mean, look at the one on my far left, Urban Outfitters. I mean, who would think that a personal diffuser sold at Urban Outfitters would be something that we'd have to be concerned about? But it is. These things are advertised to do all kinds of different things, to help you with sleep, to give you energy, vitality, Focus. I mean, who doesn't want those things? Our youth certainly are interested in all of those things in their lives. They are then adding these different essential oils and heating essential oils and then breathing them deep into your lungs is never helpful. Propylene glycol breaks down as an aldehyde, which is known to cause cancer. Any fine particulate, what we're finding is these microparticulates are extremely small, a hundredth the size of a human hair. So imagine these microparticulates being small enough to literally wrap around a human hair. That's how small they are. And you're heating those and breathing those deep into your lungs. They're tearing, and a, a, and a teenager's lungs are developing lungs and they're tearing their lungs apart. But they're, and, and there's no age restriction on these products. So youth are able to purchase these at any age. And they're extremely unhealthy. Again, no matter what it is, when you're heating it and inhaling it and inhaling it deep into your lungs, it is not safe, nicotine or not. It's not a safe product. Next slide. So it begs the question, 
which is more addictive. What research is now bringing us to is the reality that because of the way that nicotine, that uh, the way that the liquid in the new products is made with something that's called nicotine salts, they can get a higher amount of nicotine in the new disposables, plus the reality that the puff count of these new products, so I'm gonna show you one right now. This is the random paradox. There's 10,000 puffs in this device, 10,000 puffs. There's 10 to 12 puffs in a combustible cigarette. You're, when you smoke it, and, and so it's like it says, a, in the cigarette, it's a single container. You know when you're through smoking the cigarette and it's out. 10 to 12 puffs and it's out. This product, 10,000 puffs, that's the equivalent of a thousand cigarettes, my friends. That's the equivalent of 500 packs of cigarettes. So real quickly, what I'm telling you is I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of individuals to quit smoking. In all of those individuals, I can count on one hand those whose nicotine addiction was severe enough that it would wake them up at night to where they would have to have a cigarette at night. I can't tell you the number of teenagers that tell me they sleep with their vape underneath their pillow and they wake up at night having to hit their vape at night. Why? Because the nicotine content is so stinking hot that their nicotine addiction forces them to wake up at night and they have to hit it at night. And because the puff content is such that they can hit it and hit it and hit it and they don't know when it's through. My God, the, we've never seen a product that is so addictive as these new products are. Next slide. So the chemicals in these products are, are there are many of them are the same chemicals that are in a combustible cigarette. You'll see in here products like formaldehyde, cadmium, heavy, heavy, uh, metals like nickel, uh, cadmium. So again, there are some of the same chemicals as in combustible cigarettes, uh, not at the same level as combustible cigarettes. Certainly, if you were to com if you were com to compare the um, chemicals in combustible cigarettes as vaping cigarettes, you're going to consume a higher number of these chemicals in combustible cigarettes. But the reality is the chemicals are still dangerous in vaping products. All right. Wow, Bruce, you, your passion. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. I love it. So now that you guys have learned about what's in a cigarette, what's in a vape, the different types of vapes. Um, we're going to shift focus a little bit here. We're going to talk about how vaping affects the body. We're going to start with discussing the adolescent brain. As you all know, the brain does not um, stop developing until you're about age 25. And so with that being said, adolescent brain is highly susceptible to addiction. Sensitive dopamine reward pathway means rewiring for further addiction. Nicotine causes permanent cognitive changes, such as a worsened memory, processing speed, impulse control. Um, they also shift mood disorders, which can worsen um, anxiety and depression. So a lot of these things we're going to mention going forward are uh, what you and I may think are typical teenage things. If I have a 12-year-old, so pray for me, guys. Um, I feel like we're, we're moving this direction. Um, but if you yourself or someone you know you know has an issue or you feel like they are experiencing these um, effects, 
it's always best to just have an open discussion and we'll get to that a uh, few slides later. Next slide. How does vaping affect the body um, and lungs? So vape aerosol contains aerosols, which is exactly what Bruce just talked about, ultra fine particles. They reach very deep into the lung, causing irritation and inflammation. Potential for allergies to hidden ingredients, asthma definitely is affected and chronic lung disease as well. Next slide. The heart. Also, I wanna mention that vaping, tobacco, cigarette use affects every organ in the body. We're just gonna talk about a few here, but every organ is affected when someone indulges in tobacco use. So the heart, nicotine is a stimulant, which restricts the blood flow, increases blood pressure, adrenaline heart rate, um, also increases risk of cardiovascular disease and flavors, um, chemical toxic to heart cells. And Bruce talked about a lot. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of fake flavors, which are all chemically made. Next slide. Additional risk, again, weakened immune system, seizures from that nicotine poisoning that we just talked about. Gastro issues, weight loss can have a negative impact on the mouth, which affects the immune response and latter disease. Prediabetes uh, and high blood sugar are also um, harmful effects of the body when vaping comes into play. Next slide. So, um, Evali, and many of you may remember just literally um, before COVID-19 hit, there was a lot of talk about Evali in the news. And Evali is e-cigarette vaping associated lung injury. And so there were over 3,000 cases recorded, 70 deaths as of February of 2020. When the CDC, because of COVID, stopped reporting, uh, re recording the incidences, but that doesn't mean that it stopped by any stretch of the imagination. And so the reality, is, and, and, and with that, um, there was obviously um, a link to vitamin E acetate and THC with many of the cases, but we also know that there was a significant number of the cases that were nicotine users alone. So what we certainly know is that through COVID, there's still multi multiple cases of a volley that were left undiagnosed. And so there's, there's a lot of vaping associated lung injury cases that it's a real shame that we're not tracking that. And we're not tracking the cases, the seizure cases, because I've been hearing from administrators from all over the country, the students during school hours that are having uh, nicotine related seizures. You also need to know it's almost impossible to have a nicotine seizure from a combustible cigarette. It just doesn't happen. But we're seeing that more and more often, again, because of the high nicotine content and the puff count of new products. Next slide. What we're also seeing is that there's, just like Courtney had shared, is because vaping, um, smoking can often lead to lung immune system and lung damage that makes you more susceptible to respiratory diseases and COVID is a respiratory disease. So it's no surprise at all that Stanford University 
was the first during COVID to say, youth that vape are, have a much higher susceptibility rate to COVID-19, four to seven times higher rate of susceptibility to COVID-19 and also to the spread of COVID-19 because why? Often they share their vapes. So I vape, I hand it to my buddy, he vapes the same thing. And so it's the spread that way, hand to mouth contact and to cough. Next. So let's, let's get into some real nitty gritty, shall we? So why, what are some reasons that youth are vaping? Again, we've talked about flavors. It's because of the flavors, right? Um, the one, the vape that I just showed you with 10,000 vapes, snow cone, snow cone ice. Um, when I first opened this and, and pull the plug out, you don't smell it very much right now. Oh my gosh, it smelled exactly like a snow cone. It smelled stinking delicious, <laughs> right? And, and I don't know about you, but I, lo I love me a snow cone. And so, oh, oh and, and what, I, what else I didn't tell you about this, this one? You can't see it, but inside there's a metal wheel. And so when, if I were to hit it, if, which means I draw on it, that metal wheel spins and a rainbow light spin. So there's a part, I, I mean, rainbow light spin and it's a little party every time you take a hit off of it. Um, and so that's, that's what they're all about. They want to deliver a party and flavors are a party, 85%, and I think it's higher than that, uh, of, of youth use a flavored product. Because listen, if all they offered was a tobacco flavored vape, how many kids do you think would really be into that? Nah. No, 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 no. That's why kids, if they if they smoke a cigarette, um, it, it's probably a menthol because it's flavored, right? They vape also because of the targeted marketing. Because it's accessible overwhelmingly over 60% are able to buy local. And, and we know that when I talk to kids, um, it, it's really pretty easy to buy online, but it's it, kids usually buy locally. They know someone that can get it for them or they know where they can go locally to buy. It's real easy. Next. Um, also, social norms. I talked to a school administrator in Arizona last week. And um, they had a school shooting uh, a couple weeks ago. And so they had a much tighter security system. They started to check book bags. And the administrator said, we found a vape product in literally almost every book bag. That's social pressure, right? When almost everyone in the school has a vape product in their book bag, and, and they were handing them back. They weren't keeping them. They were giving them back to the kid. That social pressure. When almost, I mean, because in the past, we would tell kids in Catch My Breath, we'll talk about that, we would tell them most we hear that most everyone's doing it. Don't believe it. They're not doing it. Here's the principal telling me, oh, ev almost everyone is doing it. Mm. That's, that's social pressure. Um, heightened stress. Uh, I, I won't go into it, but the reality is pre-COVID, about 80% of kids said that they 
they, their friends were stressed and anxious, those numbers doubled after COVID. The head rush kids said that because again, the high nicotine content, that first hit, boom, you get a major head rush. Kids like that. Um, the high addictiveness. Um, it, it doesn't, you don't have to get be addicted from daily use. The reality is everyone has a different level of, of, of how many times you have to vape to get addicted. And, and we're seeing, again, because of the high puff count, high nicotine level, it doesn't take using a whole lot to become addicted. And, but, but the perceived lower risk, 30 in, in um, one study said 33%, and that's a high percent, 33% said that vaping is, uh, nicotine is no more addictive than a cup of coffee. So kids don't think that it's an issue. Next slide. All right, so we're gonna talk about vape and how it's hidden and it's right in front of our eyes. As parents, as kinship givers, vape is literally, these companies have gotten so smart um, with this vape thing. We've seen things um, most recently, vape backpacks, where they have a vape in the backpack, they can take a puff and put it back. I've seen vape hoodies, so the little drawstrings on your hood are vapes, contain vapes. And as you see here from this image, there's a desk here um, where there are vape products hidden. Just we're gonna take a second. If you think you know what where the vape is, kind of maybe type it in the chat um, or say, "Wow, I don't, I didn't know." Give me your thoughts on this image. There are four vape products hidden in this image. So if you think you know, type it in the chat for me um, or. Um, just tell me what you think about this image, and I'll give a couple seconds here to see. Black next to the flash drive. Okay, we'll see in a minute. Anybody else? Angela was so brave to type that in there. Anybody else want to share quickly where they think the four vape products are hidden? This kind of looks like my guess. Um, anybody else? You Okay, yellow highlighter, yellow. Okay, okay. Got two answers there. All right, next slide. We're gonna you're gonna amaze yourself, people. Let's see. So there are your four vape products. So they were right with the highlighter, right with the flash drive. Yes. Yeah, so in here there are some vape products hidden. This is what our our kids' desk at, at home could look like. Our kids' desk at school could look like. And Bruce, you holding up something there? Let yeah, here's my here's the backpack. Yeah, here's the backpack, and it's built right into. Uh, yeah, so all you have to do is, I don't even have to take it out. All I have to do is hit it right there, and and here's the vaping hoodie. So yeah, yeah. So these products are really under our eye, um, put uh, hidden again in plain sight. So we just want to give you a few. Um, images so that you're aware if you happen to spot it, see it, um, that you're just more aware and more heightened into what you see. Next slide, please. And with that being said, since they are hidden in plain sight, we also want to equip you with tools to, to know if your kid, your teen, your loved one is vaping. So here are some signs. It's about 10 of them. We're going to go through them real quick. Um, secreted, closed doors, frequent excuses, going to the restroom or outside often. Keep in mind that these may seem like typical things that a teenager is going through, um, but if you happen to see an increase, a heightened increase in these, um, then it'll be time to have a discussion with the teen in your life. Sweet smell. Um, so Bruce just talked about all those flavors, the unicorn. I mean, that one bake you held up, Bruce, really made me feel like I was at the circus with the fan going and the lights, like, whoa. So sweet smell, use of candles, um, a room fresher, trying to disguise that smell um, if you as a parent or um, caregiver were going to their room. Dry mucus membrane, so nose, throat, mouth, which is also a um, harmful effect to the body that we discussed previously. Drinking more, craving more salt or spice, nosebleeds, mouth sores. 
unusual items in the room like plastic cups, USB drives, small highlighters and pens, which we just saw on the slide previously. Changes in sleep patterns, raspy voice, heightened caffeine sensitivity, jitterness, anxiety, changes in their eating habits. We know teens love to eat. So changes in those habits, nausea, weight loss, and unknown or increased spreading, spending, sorry, or deliveries. So um, also Bruce talked about home deliveries and how teens are getting things mailed to the home. So if you see those decreases or changes in those spending habits, that may be an indicator of teen vaping. Next slide. So once you have that teen um, who you know is vaping or who you suspect is vaping, it's time to have a conversation. So we're gonna talk about this. We want you to come from a place of understanding and support uh, remember also that we were kids too, but in our generation, it was cigarettes. So we were teens, our friends have tried it, um, but we also want to come from a, a place of understanding and support, realizing that kids are targets. We saw all throughout this presentation how marketing tactics are really particularly targeting our youth. Um, so they may not think it's harmful because it's, it's marketed as an easy, safer option. So it seems normal. Do your homework as a kinship caregiver, a parent, an adult, so you understand and can share some of those harmful effects that we discussed that concern you. Next slide. Uh, found the right time, start early. Uh, we're seeing that kids as young as nine have vaped for the very first time. And so we really want you all to have this discussion with your youth in elementary school, because by the time they get to high school, everybody's doing it as Bruce talked about. Um, you may use situations that you see on TV. Recently, every movie I've watched had some type of character smoking, something of some sort. So that can be an opportunity to slide in that conversation of, about vape. Don't let this be a one-time conversation. Repeatedly have this conversation with, with your youth. Be respectful and considerate of their privacy. This may be a very sensitive topic, topic for, uh, for you to discuss with you. Next slide approach no one single approach talk with and not at your youth don't lecture them ask questions but at the same time while we're asking we have to pause and listen teens have a lot to say more than we think so give them a chance to talk as well be clear that you disapprove of vaping but avoid accusation shame and blame can create that distance that gap um, between our loved ones Avoid scare tactics and exaggeration. Next slide, please. And what else can caregivers do? Talk and listen, be an advocate, and we'll give you a chance to be an advocate at the end of this presentation as well. Model the behavior. No sense in me smoking or vaping, and then I tell the child, hey, don't do what I do. Encourage conversations with other trusted adults. Talk with your family, your pediatrician, local addiction specialist, and use quit resources. They are out there to be used. Go easy on yourself. Kids are targets. They um, are targeted by industry, and it is not their fault that everywhere they look, they see someone vaping or an ad. That is not their fault, so I want you to realize that. Uh, for more information about pay, there is a private online support group uh, for you. Um, or someone you know that may need help or you want to help support them. And it is uh, Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes page, and it is on Facebook. Next slide. Okay, so some more help. Because if there's a teen in your life that is vaping and having trouble in quitting, where do you go for help? Well, first of all, start with your pediatrician um, and, and involve them in the process. There's a lot of different tools in the quit process. Um, and one is the Truth Initiative, and the link is there. Um, this is Quitting app is real helpful. Smoke Free Gov is real helpful. Um, in talking to your pediatrician, the American Academy of Pediatrics certainly um, approves of nicotine replacement therapy for vaping. It's off-label, but it's uh, 
gum and lozenges specifically, behavioral support is there. So those are both really good um, tools for a pediatrician to use. Also, also, well, uh, exactly what we understand with adults trying to quit is relapse is normal. So if there's a teen in your life that is wanting to quit and they struggle with quitting, that's normal. And so don't, don't chastise them, um, just understand that it's normal be, and, and express that to them, that if, if they if they're show disappointment in themselves, talk to them about how nicotine addiction is so difficult. But what's important is to continue to try and, and let's find another tool and, and, and let's don't give up. It's a process relapse is normal and to keep trying. That's what's important. Next slide. There are a couple other really nice tools. Oh. Whoa. There's a couple other. Hold on uh, just one moment, my apologies. Oh, that's all right, not a problem. There's a couple other really nice tools as Charlie pulls it back up. One is that you'll see as soon as we get it, um, my Life, My Quit, which is a teen cessation program um, in, in uh, there we go, there it is. Look at how quick we got that. Uh, it from the Ohio Department of Health and specifically designed for teens. So it is fantastic. So again, these slides will be available for you. You can get, uh, so it, it's, it, again, it's designed for teens. Then become an X. And I wanted to highlight that again for you as a caregiver, because there is specific um, tips and a coach for adults. So if, if you need help, in how to help your team uh, become an ex will have tips for you. Next. So school-based curriculum, if you want to, if if you don't, if you want to be involved in your school, there are some different things that and uh, some school curricula. Stanford has great help catch my breath. There are other, uh, American Heart Association has a toolkit for schools because one thing that we want to do is move away from suspending kids that are caught using. And we want to address the addiction, not the behavior. So the American Heart Association has a great toolkit to help schools move away from that um, in depth from the American Lung Association is an alternative to suspension. Stanford has a great alternative to suspension um, program as well. Next. So we know that vapes are indeed trash. Um, and tobacco, cigarette butts are the number one polluted item in the world. Um, however, we really wanted to um, show you this youth campaign that talks about social and environmental impacts of e-cigarettes in the tobacco industry. And you can get more information about that at vapesartrash.org. And so we really want to put this in here so that you can see and learn for yourself why vapes are indeed trash and how harmful they are for our environment. Everywhere you look, you see tobacco wrappers. Um, I've found vapes on the sidewalks and people just disposing them, but they are um, combustible and they are very extremely harmful. 
Okay, we're about ready. We're doing great on time. So we had Columbus had a press conference on uh, on the on August four because they are moving towards a flavor ban. And it was a marvelous press conference. You can see the Congresswoman uh, Beatty was there, former Mayor Coleman was there. Um, over, they have support from over 80 faith-based churches, pastors that are involved, healthcare, all, all of your major hospital networks, schools, on and on and on. We would love for kinship to be involved and support this. We would love for you personally to sign on and be involved as Columbus moves to this important endeavor. So the next slide will show you how to do that. So if you can take out your phone or when you get these slides, you can take a Pick, get your phone out and scan so that you can become an advocate in your community. With PAVE, you'll be able to get the information on how you can become, get involved in Columbus, be a volunteer and sign up. We'll get you linked with the Columbus Coalition. And then, oh, so it's it's not working for someone and it's working for Angela. This will be out in the slides too. So you'll yes. get this information. Once we send the slides out, this will be in there as well. And then the last slide. When you, if please go to uh, parentsagainstvaping.org there's a lot of other information and um, they've got a great podcast, a lot of great topics. And so like, here's a couple of examples of a couple of the different um, podcasts. Um, you can see that um, on, on episode 13, Actually, and I'm thrilled, I, I don't know if they've added this one on purpose or if they did this just for me, but it's with Derek Peterson, the founder and CEO of Solder Technology, my boss, my friend. Uh, so that's fantastic. But there's all kinds of different great podcasts that uh, along with um, a great information and different ways. Oh, look at that, Darlene, I, I'd already sent it to her, her son. So are there, let's open this up to questions of any type we've got, uh, and we can stay later if folks have questions, but we wanna answer questions that you have. Absolutely, if we did great, give us a thumbs up. If it's you know, something you wish was added different, you know, what what went well, what are you going to take back to your communities and your home environment? Uh, we want to hear from you. You guys are the the gurus in this, and we, we need as much of your support as we can possibly get. So um, any thoughts, feel free to type it in the chat. Um, anything that... Uh, or, or there may be things that you, questions that you had that we didn't answer that you would love to have answered. So... It, it's it's your turn now. We have Miss Pam with her hand raised. You want to unmute? Yeah. Hi. Um. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. I just want to ask. Like my my grandson is eleven that I'm raising, and he's got like he already has like a, a horrible food addiction thing going on. But his dad vapes and smokes and stuff. And um, you know, I hope he doesn't do. But what I want to ask is, do you think it's okay for him to see this? Video, not the part about what you should tell your kids, but about how dangerous it is. It's okay to t show these kids this, right? How do you feel about that? I, I, I do. I think it's very important to to show children. Just as we discussed, I have a twelve year old, so 
um, is Pam. He is not much older. Okay. Right? Because it just seems like it'd be a lot more effective him hearing this versus hearing it from grandma. Grandma says this and grandma says that. Yeah. You know, I, I would agree with you. And also, I've shared this presentation with my son. Even I've spoken to his classmates, his entire school body. I've spoken to them. Um, um, so I use the opportunity when we see someone vaping, we open a discussion up and talk about it. Um, not in a negative way, but, you know, it's a room for discussion when we see it. So I just wanted to encourage you um, to share these slides and have a dialogue. Allow him to ask questions of you as well at the end of the videos or the slides. So, yeah, wonderful suggestion and great hey, idea. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Pam. And, and, and let me just uh, add to that. Bill, stop as, as you're watching it together and say, so what, what do you think about that? Yeah. When you hear that, what do you, what do you think? What do you see? When you go to school, what do you see? Good one. Good one. Okay, and, that's and, good. Have, and just have a dialogue and have a, con because I do that. My, my twin granddaughters are now in the fourth grade. Listen, we have conversations all the time. Yeah, and, and, and that's and that's just real important just to talk. Okay, thank you. This has been a real blessing and a gift to have this to hear this today. Thank you, everybody. So we are so happy that you attended. Thank you so much, Miss Pam. Thank you. Anybody else? And 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 if I can just add a little bit more to that, because what here's what I see when and and I don't. I don't do one-time presentations with high school kids because we know that one-time presentations uh, is not good prevention. But when um, I'm, I am often asked to speak to faculty and so that gives them an opportunity to talk to kids. And when I talk to kids, um, I ask them where they get their information. And high school kids get their information from crap resources, junk resources. And so um, I, we need to provide information to kids from reliable resources, right? Reliable resources. And so um, being able to provide reliable resources and have conversations about that is is vitally important and so then asking in in talking with kids then um say so so where did you hear that because they're hearing a lot of things and then saying so you know where did you hear that and and then track that down and and just again continue that conversation um, as Bruce just said, I think just that good point. Communication is key. I think, especially with young people, you know, like you said, Pam, your grandson's 11. All kinds of things around him are changing. His body is changing. His brain is changing. And his peers and how he feels is changing. So there's a lot of things around him that, that are changing. And so I think a conversation as such would allow the opportunity uh, for a closer relationship, A, with you, and B, to undercover those myths about tobacco and vape. You know, as we said, those companies are targeting him, targeting us and saying it's, it's safer, it's better for you. Um, when in fact the slides and the data um, and the concrete resources say otherwise. And so that'd be a good opportunity to kind of break down those myths. Um, and as he said, just listen, where did you hear that? Are kids at your school vaping? What have you seen so far? Um, some of those answers we're not ready for. Uh, but they're coming and we need to be aware of them. I just wanted to make an additional comment. Um, first of all, I think this presentation was amazing. I even learned so much that I didn't know. And it even did change a lot from last time, which I think just shows like all of the new products that come out and how quickly evolving it is. Um, but I'm like 25 and I see like tons of my friends doing this. Like I went to a bachelorette party two weekends ago and I think I was the only one who didn't vape and these are like people who work in social work like they have degrees where they could like get information about this so it's just like surprising and so true like how much of a problem it is and how it does like persist even into adulthood too unfortunately 
I definitely agree with that. I, I too was at a wedding and a lady next to me indoors was vaping. She totally didn't know who she sat next to. Um, and I said, ma'am, you smoke. It's like, I'm not smoking, I'm vaping. And I was like, oh, come on. You know, she totally didn't equate the, the two, the correlation between the two. So I think that, that again, is great marketing uh, for these tobacco companies, in your case too, Angela, at that bachelorette party where they didn't feel there was anything wrong. They didn't equate that, the harmful effects or risk, um, and that it is indeed, vaping is the same thing as smoking. And so that's why, you know, people do it indoors. I'm at the Red game or, you know, the Cavaliers game and people are indoors doing it. And it's like, what are you thinking? But they don't know. It's so market safer and a better option for you. And so they don't, they don't equate the two. I wanted to say something too. I know um, it's funny that when Ms. Angela was talking, I am a, uh, uh, in army reserves and i just came back from deployment of um the middle first part of the year and it seems like all soldiers around me i would say a majority of them were vaping um, and it was interesting what you said about uh waking up in the middle of the night vaping because one of my uh roommates i would just air all night literally every night all night he would wake up, whether it was two o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, he would wake up and I would hear his vape going off all night, every night. And I was like, ah, that's why I knew it wasn't addicting, but I didn't really catch the, you know, the magnitude of it until you just, you know, you mentioned that. And I was like, it literally was every night, all night to the point where I just, I will, couldn't wait to get away from him. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, I thought that it, was interesting and he's yeah. young he's um i think he's he's in his late 20s maybe 30 years old yeah it's it's amazing and and david i appreciate that uh military is the number of um military that are vaping and, and that were smoking that have made the transition because it's a younger population now that are vaping is huge. Yeah, I, I I try to talk to them, you know, as a as a uh, succession counselor, you know, I, I try to I try to talk to them and get them a little bit of education, you know, which like yeah, you yeah, know, like okay, but if you're around me and you're standing around me, you you, you got to take that someplace else, you know, um, and I outrank all of them, so they have to do what I say. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think you yeah. also touched David on second and third hand just a bit. You yeah. Know, you and, were in the room with him. You know, he didn't really go deep into second and third hand smoking the presentation, but that is very important as well because as when, in my portion of the presentation, when I talked about the harmful effects and how it affects the body, mm -hmm. that also goes for second and third hand smoke. Yes, you're absolutely right. So a lot of people don't realize that they'll stand in, in a huddle and have conversation with someone that is vaping. But you're still at risk, even though it's not up to, up to your lips and you're not the actual one vaping, you kind of might as well take part if you're like right, right in the room with that person. Absolutely. Hi, I got a comment real quick. This is Yaya. It should be on the screen, Yaya. So I'm raising two grandkids, so this is my second time around raising some kids. And I just, I, I, I'm, I don't smoke. I never smoke. So I don't pay attention to the ads. I don't pay attention to none of it. I don't like it. It costs too much. It, I just don't smoke. So this was very informative for a grandmother like me that's raising grandkids because I need to know these things. Yeah. This wasn't this wasn't in when I was raising my kids. But it was funny because I remember the first day I seen my daughter at the time, I think she might have been 14 or 15, smoking a cigarette. And I just remember saying, Huh, I wonder who buys those for her. You know, I didn't, I didn't, hmm. And then as she would get older, I would say, oh girl, go smoke your cigarette and come back when you calm down. Not realizing that's really why she was smoking a cigarette. That's really why she was smoking a cigarette because she would be one person and I'd be like, girl, go smoke that cigarette. And she'd come back and be my daughter again. So I felt like I might've turned her on to it even more you know but now that I'm a grandmother we got D 
these things y'all y'all talking about vapors i'm what the heck <laughs> you know like so this is just another conversation to have with my grandsons as they are growing up because they're eight and ten and i don't hold nothing back when i talk to them i ask them about their friends uh what you watching on the internet what you so now is another one hey which i know about and this is a good video that i can sit and watch with my 10 year old my yeah. eight year old he'd be like i don't want to be bothered but the yeah. 10 year old yeah he, he'll sit down and watch it with me that eight year old he ain't <laughs> no yeah you're right perfect so thank you thank you thank you thank you for that Anyone else? Well, before we wrap, I did just want to thank Angela real quick and Kinship Caregivers for co-sponsoring uh, and working with us in this event. And we are just so grateful to you all. And again, uh, to Courtney and Bruce for hosting and co-presenting. Just thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. I would like to say thank you as well. <laughs> this was such great and needed information. and. I'm definitely interested in how I can advocate more for a topic like this, and I hope others are as well. So hopefully we're happy to give back and also advocate because it is such a big um, issue. And I appreciate everyone sharing too. Um, and just thank you so much for your time and expertise to everyone at PAVE, because I know it is a volunteer organization and kind of grassroots, so we need more organizations like that. So really, thank you so much for all this information and for your time and expertise. All right. For having us. Our pleasure. Great being with you. Take care, everyone. A great afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate everything you guys did and showed us and told us. Thank you. All right. Bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye.